Well, we, tr we try to promote any kind of cooperation we can across the border, and specifically the tripart military arrangements where we and the Afghans and the Pakistanis get together and work on the, on the military tensions. But we've also tried to work on cross-border trade, uh, opening up transit trade across uh, Pakistan and across Afghanistan into Central Asia. Uh, we've tried to work on sort of tribe-to-tribe, governor-to-governor relationships, anything we can do to get them to really work cooperatively on a border. Because the only way we're going to solve the terrorism problem is to bring these areas in under government control, but also to, to have both sides fighting the terrorists and trying to develop these areas. Yeah, and, and despite the occasional outbreak of bullets and, and fighting and, and sharp accusations back and forth, actually, both governments say they want to do these things. Actually, getting them to do it is a lot harder. But they're both well inclined. It's getting the, the actual facts to, to reflect that that's hard. I think we need to do both. In 2007, we put in an extra 3,500 U.S. troops, and the foreign forces increased by about 3,500 as well. 2008, we increased U.S. troops further, and we had further increases in, in uh, NATO contributions, including the French moving uh, into the areas where the combat is most serious in the east, and that let us put some of our troops in the south. So I think there's a U.S. component to doing this where we have to take the lead, but we also should expect our allies to match uh, any increases that we make. So far, so good. I mean, people always talk about donor fatigue and, you know, people getting tired, but somehow every time we come forth, we can get others to help as well. We, people talked about money problems, and we had June of 2008, a very successful conference in Paris that we put up $10 billion over the next five years or so, the next couple of years, and sure enough, uh, foreigners, uh, the other countries put up another $10 billion, so it was very successful. Well, I think you have to start out by saying we're very, you know, we worked hard to make sure there was a decent election in Pakistan. It was a transition to civilian government. It was time for that. Now we have to work with that. There's a lot of politics in Pakistan. We have to get used to it. We have to learn how to work with all the political parties, with the various institutions like, you know, the governors and the army and other institutions in Pakistan. I think you see a bigger, we, we continue to believe there's a, a democratic center that's the best basis for fighting terrorism. And so we have to deal with everybody in that regard. We also have to build the institutions that can provide stability, like the election commissions, the judiciary, the police, and the education system, things like that. A lot to do is basically modernizing Pakistani institutions across the board and working with everybody. That's not really true uh, over the years. I mean, you, we've, we've provided... Um, about seven or eight hundred million dollars a year in assistance to Pakistan. Uh, half or more than half of that has always been economic assistance. Um, at the same time, we do provide military reimbursement. Some people lump it all together and get numbers. But in the end, um, we're trying to expand the non-military side. We think that if you can open up economic opportunities, you, you can, kids can get jobs instead of picking up guns. You've got to expand and, and improve the education system so kids go to public school instead of madrasas. Uh, we've got to build the institutions that can guarantee democracy, like the ones I mentioned before. So in the end, you know, there's a lot, there's a democratic opportunity here that means that we ought to be doing what we've been doing, plus new things. And there's sentiment even on Capitol Hill for doing that. Well, we're, we're trying to deal very seriously with it. We understand um, that, that nobody... Um, likes to see civilian casualties. I mean, every innocent life that's lost is really, uh, we deeply regret that. We don't like to see that happen. Taliban have used villages. They go in and, and hide among the civilians. They go into farmhouses and start shooting out from those. Um, and, you know, when our forces are attacked, they fight back. But uh, we try to do everything we can to minimize the casualties, try to do everything we can to coordinate with the Afghans on the facts and, and further analysis and steps to prevent this in the future. But I think in the end, you know, what we're fundamentally doing in Afghanistan, helping the government move out into the districts and the provinces, helping provide safety for people through policemen, government services, health, education, roads, electricity for economic opportunity. It's getting that apparatus out there into the provinces that's going to stabilize the country. And if we do that, I think citizens will feel safer and they'll feel like their government has provided the services. We've done a lot, you know, the health care is better, the education system is better, a lot of roads have been built. But until we get government out into all the provinces, we're still going to have fighting, and that's going to mean there's going to be 
casualties as much as we try to prevent them. I think the, the key goal, and this is a change of history, because the key goal is to have an open Afghanistan that can be a conduit of ideas and energy and goods and, and melons and everything through Central and South Asia. And that, for 200 years, Afghanistan has been a block, and now it's going to be an open hub. And that's the real goal. And, and to help Afghan achieve that, we've got to stabilize Afghanistan and Pakistan. And then we've got to start opening up the routes for electricity and roads and trucks and all that stuff. We're working on that at the same time.